afternoon, everyone. I, it's my pleasure to introduce Drew Mata, the director of the Peace Paper Project. Drew visited our campus the last two years. We're pleased that we can continue our partnership through virtual workshops so he can share his talent and activism with our campus and community. Last week, Drew gave us a lecture as part of the WSU Common Reading Program and this year's book, Born a Crime. Today, he's giving us a tour of his studio and demonstrating how to make paper at home. Drew spends his time between the US and his home in Hamburg, Germany, where he is today. He received his Master's of Fine Arts in Book and Paper Arts from Columbia College, Chicago, and his Bachelor's of Arts, or, sorry, of Fine Arts and Printmaking from Buffalo State College. He is the director of the Peace Paper Project, and he has established more than 40 studios across the world, inspiring others through his experience and career in paper making, in addition to several other art mediums, such as photography and bookbinding. Today, we will learn about the healing work Drew has done with underserved communities. He says, quote unquote, the process of making paper is a direct manifestation of resilience as it requires breaking something down in order to create something new and beautiful, end quote. Over the years, he has used hand paper making as a therapeutic process to help individuals who have experienced trauma and loss. Next week, Drew will give a hands-on bookbinding workshop. We will post the website with more details in the chat. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. Please join me in welcoming artist and master paper maker, Drew Maddox. Thanks, Drew. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, hello everybody. Uh, I think, can I just roll like this? You can see me. Okay, now if I hit this button, I want to flip the camera. This is where maybe Aaron comes in. No. So if I flip my camera around, you can see this, the rest of it, right? Okay, good. So um, let me go back. Because uh, uh, here we are, I'm, I'm in the studio uh, <clears throat> here in Hamburg where I live and uh, work. Uh, we have uh, at the St. Pauli Paper Studio, we have, um, I think it's about eight different artists that work here. And, and I'm gonna give you a little tour of the studio and then we're going to make some paper. And I hope the internet holds. And so let me go get Jana. Jana is going to be our, the camera person to kind of navigate through this. Kind of froze up, but I think hello. it's okay. Look, say hello to everybody. Hi. <laughs> so I think I, I, I don't know. Hi. <laughs> so, oh, oh, let's see if we flip it now. Hold on, I just did this. There we go. Oh, oh dear, that's recording. It's that one. But I think maybe mm -hmm. I have to take this out. It's huh? fine. Okay. So, ah! But I think if you move too fast, the internet seems to dump. Yeah, she says it's good. Okay, good. Okay, super. So, um, hello and welcome to uh, uh, St. Pauli Paper Studio, where Jana and I uh, work, and we have about eight different artists that work here. So here we are in the middle of the studio. We are very fortunate that we have uh, been able to uh, rent out an entire floor of this building. So we are on the third floor, and you can't see it because it's nighttime right now. But in the day, uh, it's full of light. There's one whole side of the building is just all windows. So we have a really nice view of, uh, of the Hamburg uh, neighborhood around us. And uh, there's lots of trees and it's really wonderful. So it's a great spot to be. But also uh, we are able to have, uh, when we moved in here, it was just a big open flat. So we spent about a year building. So we built walls and put in doors and did plumbing and X, Y, Z, we put it all together so that we uh, could have different artists to come here and uh, work as well as um, uh, exist and create stuff and help pay the rent. <laughs> so uh, a couple of different things I wanna show you, just I'm gonna quickly go through the studio. Oops. 
we have coming here. <laughs> we have one, kind of one of the things that's really exciting about where we are is we have um, uh, an artist who is also a coffee roaster. And so he comes in uh, every day, uh, basically five days a week uh, and roasts coffee. So here you can see the beans that he uh, somehow gets from the boats downtown. And then he puts them in this machine here and he roasts them and he sells all of his uh, coffees to, to different uh, restaurants and cafes around the city. So he's very busy, especially during the COVID kind of lockdown light situation that we're in right now. A lot of people are not going out to the cafes because it's only coffee to go. And so most people are ordering two or three kilos of coffee from him. So he's constantly in here uh, uh, roasting and then shipping his stuff out. But you can kind of see, I think it's pretty wild. He has, you know, the beans come in all green and then they're loaded into this machine. And he has several different recipes uh, that he does and uh, he packages them up. He's extremely busy. Um, it's a nice uh, space for him. It's in the back, it's not very light. But one of the things that's a real benefit, uh, besides having lots of fresh coffee that we drink all day, every day, all night, every night, um, he also gives us uh, uh, these jute sacks that the coffee beans come in. He makes about eight of these sacks. How do you say? He empties about eight sacks a week in his coffee roasting uh, uh, enterprise. And so we are very uh, fortunate to have these sacks. So a lot of the paper that we make uh, here is made from the jute sacks. One sack will make about 100 to 200 sheets of paper, depending on the thickness. And so he keeps us very busy. But here's our backlog. This is uh, this week's and some of last week's uh, sacks that we have to make paper out of. So uh, it's called Hermetic Coffees um, and uh, super awesome. So this is one of the artists that we have here at the studio. I'll take you now to the, down the hall here. It's really good door. Thank you. Uh, this is Jana Schumacher, who's the camera person. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> Yana, uh, Yana is a drawing and painting artist. Uh, she actually visited Richland uh, a few years ago when we were there. Um, she does drawing and painting and then creates uh, installations. So this is her studio. So some of the work is framed and on its way out or on its way in from exhibitions. Um, she currently has work up downtown uh, 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 as part of an exhibition uh, there. And so this is where she creates. You can see over here, we have these big, wonderful, huge uh, windows. And in the day, there's just so much daylight. It's really quite an incredible space. So that's Yana's space. And then come down the hall, I'll take you into a small little space. This is, um, um, this is an artist here. Um, who, she's a painter and she comes in and does these paintings. You can see that, the paintings are almost falling off the wall. So uh, she just finished uh, an exhibition of work and now she's working on new pieces. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's very much encapsulated. She's a royal painter. And then we go across the hall here. And we have, <laughs> uh, this is kind of uh, one of the kind of more exciting things uh, happening, I think, here is we have these resale graphic printers. So this is a printmaking technique that kind of this convergence of Xerox printing and silkscreen printing. And uh, these, these artists, uh, it's a group of three artists from uh, Austria who have made their way to Hamburg and they've set up this uh, resale graphic printing studio. And so um, they do open studios on Thursdays where people come in, um, during COVID times, they have to register and everybody wears a mask. So everybody um, uh, uh, registers and comes in. They have different projects that they want to run, and then they actually print them out onto the machine. They make books, uh, uh, they do zines, they do a whole uh, gambit of things. And uh, the, the work that they do, you can see, is, is quite varied um, from, from whatever. But they're part of a whole cultural kind of uh, seen in probably America, but I only know it to the European scene of Riso graphic printing. So they're called Riso Fort, and we've been doing quite a bit of work with them where they've been printing on hand and paper. So this is a very, these guys are super busy. Uh, 
just like the coffee roaster on Mika, they're printing all the time. And then we'll pass quickly through the paper in the studio because you're going to see this more in depth. <clears throat> we also have all the, all the way back here, we have a visiting artist uh, apartment, which is where I was calling you guys from. And so in here, I'm not sure it's going to be loud enough, but we have a little loft apartment. So we host interns, we host uh, visiting artists, we host guests, um, researchers, uh, people are able to come and stay here. So this entire uh, area is zoned for working and living. So uh, people are able to uh, live and work in their studios, uh, which is kind of rare, uh, not only here in Germany, but also in America. So it's a real treat to be able to have this, this, uh, this visiting artist apartment. Um, last year, I guess I shouldn't say last year, the year before last, the first summer that we were here, we hosted four different artists, one from Paris, uh, one from New Zealand and two from America. And they all stayed here for one month and executed projects uh, either here directly at the St. Paul Paper Studio or in the city with the Coco office. So it's quite exciting. And there's a very nice big bathroom. A bath. Uh, or as they say in Germany, a bath too. So, so this is a, it's a really nice, uh, it's very compact, but it's nice. And so if you're here visiting and you walk out, this is the studio bathroom. And then you're here in the paper making studio. Uh, here we have our kitchen, which is uh, used by all the artists, as well as the guests. And it's basic uh, laundry, all that kind of stuff. We spend so much time here that it's very important to have a, a kitchen. So that's the, uh, the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of the studio. And um, now I'm gonna show you the paper making where we actually make the paper. And the first thing that we have here, we are kind of set it up so that Jan can shoot a video. So it appears a little bit smaller than it is. But we have, <clears throat> we have scissors. Uh, today I, I was, we're going to make paper out of a couple things, but um, you know, we have we have underwear, which is uh, you know a, a fiber that we use uh, here and also in the United States. Uh, people donate their underwear or they bring it into workshops. And we use it uh, for workshops uh, to raise awareness about sexual violence in the community. So here in Hamburg, just like everywhere else in the world. There um, is uh, there's, uh, sexual violence uh, around. And so we use the underwear as the vehicle to engage people in a conversation about sexual violence. And so today I'm just gonna cut up, because we have some of this underwear here, um, cut up some of the underwear. The thing is, uh, the, these underwears are about 100% cotton. So I'm removing the, the banding and uh, which is the elastic part. We don't want to use too much of that. And then I'm just gonna put this uh, onto my, my mat. And then I'm gonna use my rolling cutter to, to kind of cut it up like a, cut it like a pizza. And uh, I'm gonna put it in here in the bucket. <clears throat> So yeah, you don't want to use non-cellulose material for paper. So if you do use rag to make paper, old clothing like underwear, uh, you want to make sure to get rid of this, the latex or the spandex or the, the non-cellulose material that's in there. So you have to wrap underwear, we're cutting up. Yeah, it's dicing it up and it's really hard. Makes really quick work of it. Do a couple more here and then we'll be on to the next step. So here's that part. So there we go. So the this underwear is uh has a lot of this kind of uh, rubber banding and stuff in it. So I'm just going to let it be and then include it. And when the paper's done, it'll have some texture. So that's it. 
So that was, I don't know, five pieces of underwear, pairs of underwear. And this would probably make about 30 sheets of paper. So it's actually a little bit of fiber goes a long way. So I'll, I'm gonna show you the next step after the, the fiber is cut up. We come into uh, here, we have our Hollander beater. So this is the room that um, we have our machine that cuts, uh, basically transform the textile into paper pulp. So you can see there's a roll, a bladed roll. And these blades are fairly sharp. Uh, I sharpen them regularly in order to make sure that it's beating properly. And then down here is another set of blades in the machine. And so uh, this machine was designed in the 1600s and it was designed specifically to transform uh, textile or old clothing into paper pulp. Okay, so I put the, lowered it down. This particular uh, design or model was uh, made by an engineer in Boston named Lee McDonald. And I commissioned him to make a portable Hollander beater. So this machine, you can see here is built like a tent. And so it breaks down and the motor comes off and the entire thing breaks down and fits into a small suitcase or a backpack and uh, only weighs about 19 kilos. Uh, so it's very portable, very lightweight, and it really has enabled us to do the work that we do around the world. This is the model that we have that's pretty much stationary here. So now I'm gonna add a couple buckets of water. And uh, it's going to get loud, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to do it. I'm going to turn the machine on, and then it's going to start circulating the water, and then I'm going to start adding the underwear that I've cut up into the uh, Hollander beater basin, and you'll start to see it uh, kind of circulate. And it takes about 15 or 20 minutes for it to transform into pulp. So uh, by the time uh, we're done here with the rest of the demonstration, I'll be able to show you um, what this looks like. Okay. So I'm going to turn this on. Start to see, but there's a huge bucket that's full of pulp. So uh, after I'm 
done talking to you guys tonight, I'll be pulling sheets of paper. There's probably about 50 or 60 sheets of pulp uh, paper uh, with the pulp there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the pulp here to my big basin. You can see my basin. Uh, it's just a European wash tub here. I found this on the street and then brought it into the studio and built it up. So this is what a wash uh, shower basin looks like in Eastern Europe. And I've just added water to it. And now I've added my pulp. And I'm doing what's called hogging the vat. So I'm mixing up that uh, fiber. You kind of see the hemp. Hemp fiber is like, has this kind of long stringy kind of component. So uh, to form our sheets of paper, <laughs> we need to have something called a mold. Uh, the mold is a frame that has a, a screen over the top of it. And so in this case, this is a grass woven mold. Here at the backside has these really nice ribs. Um, these are fairly expensive. There's only um, a few people in the world that make these molds. This was $2,500 for this mold. So this is a, a um, these are a hot commodity. Uh, there. Uh, the one, we have a frame that fits over the top of the mold. This is called a deckel, the German word for top. So the mold and the deckel are fitted together. Then we hog the vat, we just mix it up. And then I take my mold and my deckel and I hold it firmly in between my hands and extending my arms out from my body. I'm going to scoop it into the vat, scoop it into the water, and then I'm going to go all the way down. I'm going to pull it straight up. And then I want to shake it side to side and to and from. And this uh, uh, action is kind of like jumping into a lake. It's one quick continuous motion and it's going to allow me to form my sheet of paper. So I'm sending my arms out from my body, scooping it into the water, pulling it up, shaking it gent gently side to side. I'm not rocking it like up and down like this. I'm just kind of holding it level with the ground. And the pulp settles then onto the mold. So we wait a second here. Take the deckle off and then of course put the deckle back in the water. Kind of can let it drain a little bit here. When you're working with hemp, hemp is a, uh, the pulp is very fine, some of it is, and it, drains very slowly. We'll just kind of then lower this down onto my post here and my sheet of paper has transferred. And so what I have done here is I have a felt on the bottom and then I have some bed sheets and synthetic felt material. And I'm, I'm basically, it's called coochie. So I'm passing my um, freshly formed sheet of paper onto some felting. And then I'm taking my bed sheet or felting, synthetic felting material and putting another one down, gently kind of rubbing it into contact. Coming back to my bed, adding another scoop of pulp. And I start again, hog it. I take my mold and my deckle. Extend my arms out from my body, scoop it into the water. Shaking it side to side and to and from and letting that water drain out and allowing the pulp to settle on the mold. Then I can remove the deck. Uh, the thickness of the sheet, you can see it's kind of like has some thickness. Um, this is mostly water right now. It's something like 82% water. And so as the water runs out, the sheet gets thinner and thinner. Um, but the thickness, thickness of the sheet is referred to as the loft. It's the loft of the sheet as it sits on the mold. Um, if you would like to make a very thick sheet of paper, then you just add more pulp and have less water. If you want to have a thinner sheet, it's uh, less water and more, more, more water, less water. So here I'm passing it off. Here we go. Uh, pull 
You can see in this way, it's very uh, easy to get into a rhythm or a routine of just pulling sheets of paper one at a time. And at the end of the day, you know, you might have 150 sheets of paper or 200 sheets of paper. And extending my arms out from my body, scooping it into the water, allowing the water to drain out, and the pulp settles on the frame and let that drain. So, if you want to make paper at home, okay, one second, I have to grab the book. <laughs> Stay right there. So, the most important book, uh, if you want to get into paper making, uh, that we use uh, as hand paper makers, whether you're an expert or whether you're a novice, uh, is uh, this book here. It's the um, Paper Maker's Companion. <laughs> it's the ultimate guide to paper making. We call it the Paper Maker's Guide. And so it's uh, by an author called Helen Hebert. And uh, it's super awesome. It basically teaches you how to build your own mold and decal how to transform your living room or your office or your bathroom or your balcony or your garage or your hotel room into a full um, operating, fully operational uh, paper making studio. And so Helen Hebert's book here, The Papermaker's Companion, is the most important book that you can have if you are interested in studying or making paper. Um, there are a lot of books out there, but this is the one to get. It's about $10 on Amazon. So it's really inexpensive. And all of the different studios that uh, we've started, um, we basically um, set, uh, we set them up with this book. It's the, it's the most, it's the best resource for you. So, okay, so having said that, we're I'm gonna demonstrate really quickly how to make paper at home. And um, I hope this goes okay. I'm going to set up here a little funny, but uh, the, the key thing that you want to do uh, if you're going to make paper at home uh, and you don't have a Hollander, but if you do have a Hollander, you live in a very interesting home. <laughs> but if you don't have a Hollander, um, <clears throat> the main thing that you're going to use to generate pulp is a blender. Okay. And so a blender, uh, you know, you don't want to use your mom or your dad's uh, favorite blender, like your Super Ninja that costs $40. Um, what you want to do is you want to go to the thrift store uh, and buy a $5 blender. Um, you don't want to use a blender that you're going to use for food. You also don't want to use a blender uh, that you're not afraid to destroy, okay? Because you might destroy it in this process, depending on what you do. So here we have this very old blender. I think this thing is from around World War I time period. You know, like the birth of electricity or something. It's, it's very old, uh, an old German blender. And so uh, we're gonna put our blender piece on there. We also have uh, kind of a much larger blender. So you can buy larger blenders. This one's bigger. Uh, this one might be something that you get from like a, a restaurant that might be throwing it away or like that. But uh, this is a bigger blender. And so the blender is gonna be the key way to uh, kind of whip up your whip up your pulp. Okay. So the other thing is is the uh, is the fiber source. So we're not going to take a pair of underwear and put it in here in the blender and then be able to uh, uh, basically blend it and make paper out of it because the blender is more cutting and, and mixing and it's not pounding and, and beating like that. So you can take uh, news old newsprint. So you can take your newspaper and uh, you can use newspaper. Uh, this basically is made out of, uh, it's going to be mostly tree pulp, right? It's going to be pretty acidic, so it's not going to be archival, but if you want to make paper with it, you can. And, uh, and you can make some nice paper that might last a little while. Uh, but you can also take just uh, shredded office paper from your shredder. So it might be your junk mail, or it might be your bills that come in, or maybe it's your voter registration card, something to that effect. 
can basically take this already um, kind of post consumer uh, material and make paper out of it. And the last thing I want to show you, because we're going to be making paper out of this, is uh, especially this time of year, you can actually go into your garden. Uh, right now, I'm not sure what it's like in Richland, but here in Hamburg, uh, we're basically starting to get our first uh, frost. And so we've, I've taken the uh, pumpkin and zucchini plants and I cut them up and then I uh, cook them in a baking soda, very light baking soda solution, so nothing too aggressive or caustic. And I cooked it for about 45 minutes, boiled it for about 45 minutes in baking soda. And you can see the fibers are starting to come apart here. There's some leaves because I was lazy. Um, and here's the bits of the pumpkin and squash uh, plant. So I'm going to, we're going to make paper with it. So I'm going to take some water. I'm going to put some water in my blender. So I'll just load up both of these blenders. Um, so you want to fill up your blender about halfway or a little over halfway. And then you don't want to fill it too much with, your, with the shredded material. First of all, I've let this soak overnight, okay? There's a lot of glue and clay in this. And so you have to let it soak to get it to soft. So last night I put this in there in the bucket with some water and now it's soaked it up. And so I'm gonna put some uh, uh, shredded office material into my blenders. This one's bigger so I can get away with adding a little bit more. And then just like making a smoothie, I'm gonna add a little bit more of my yogurt or milk or whatever I have. I'm gonna put my tops on. I'm going to come around this side. Oh, oh you can see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. This one's really loaded up, but this is a much more aggressive machine. This one is not as aggressive. This is going to be similar to what you can find at your normal thrift store. So I'm going to put my lid on, something like that. Put this on. Uh, so first I'll get this kind of going. Mixing. This is a pretty serious blender. This is a full horsepower motor. So we are mixing. So there's that one. Here, let's try to get this to see. Here. Here's our 1918 German blender. Let's see. So that for pulp generating. We grab this guy, yeah. use my big 1915 hands here. And now I'm going to pour it into a bucket and uh, put it back. Let's see how this one did. So similar. So the blender is in using shredded office material. It's, it's definitely a sufficient way to render your pulp. Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> And we have quite a bit of pulp here now that's ready. Sometimes it gets jammed up down here, but that's okay. We'll just use that later. So, yeah. <laughs> so I want to, um, what's that? <laughs> yeah, there we go. So now I want to uh, show you, we're going to make a uh, pulp with the, the remainder of this uh, kind of uh, garden waste. So you can see after the cook, it's pretty just gooey already. And I'm just going to put it in here, see what else we can pull out of here. Okay, so I'm going to add it. Now I'm going to add a little scoop on top. You add your fiber, and you add a little more water. Lock that down, and then... 
Post, which is very similar to the, the other setup. It's basically felting and uh, uh, like old bed sheets and things. Here. And now here's my sheet here. Actually, it looks pretty good. It's a little green, it's got some speckle, a little punkish. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it down, I'm gonna cooch it. Uh, Onto the my felting onto my post, and so I'm not going to kind of like charge it and slap it down. I'm basically just going to start at the center and very slowly kind of lower it down, press down on the back side, and open it up. And you can see the sheet of paper has transferred. So now I'm going to do it again. On the count of one, two, three, and well, the smaller ones are a lot easier. I don't mind that little chunkiness of it. Okay. Let this drain. I'm going to remove the decal. So you can see it's not that difficult to, to these molds and decals. Uh, these ones are very expensive, but you could actually just take like a, a, a 
picture frame and, and staple some window screen on it. You know, you could do it very, very simply. You could just duct tape some, some window uh, screen onto uh, some canvas stretchers, if you will. The easiest is to get some picture frames and then just stretch uh, screens over top. And then I'm going to close this up. And uh, I'm not sure I got to check the time. So I want to really quickly uh, show you the Hollander meter again, and then I'm going to take some pulp out of it, and we'll do another sheet on the touch base here. So I don't know if you can hear it, but it's basically making a more high pitch noise, uh, which is means it's done. So let's go check it out. So here's our pulp. I'm going to add it and let's pull one. So here I can go straight from the, from the machine. I'm going to add it to our vat. So you can kind of see it's not completely done. It's still a little stringy. So it needs about five more minutes, maybe three. Um, so I'm gonna add some to our vat. And then I'm not even gonna mix it up. I'm just gonna let it hang out there. And then I'm gonna scoop my pulp, my molded necklin, and grab some of that pulp. And this will create kind of a marbled look. If I don't mix it up and I add colors. So there is the back side, and then I'll lay it down. Or that front side. Let's see. There's the back side. Let me see there. So this is one way to make decorative sheets. There's many different ways to do, to do decorative sheets. <laughs> Um, I'm going to remove the decal. So after, uh, at the end of the night, so a few hours from now for me, um, I'm going to pull a whole bunch of paper. Um, I'm going to load it into this hydraulic press here, and I'm going to press the water out, and then I'm going to hang uh, the, the sheets of paper to dry. Um, by tomorrow morning, they should be relatively dry with a little fan. Um, and so uh, this is kind of a more traditional way of drying paper. You just press it and you hang it to dry. It's actually what we did uh, at the Tri-Cities campus um, the last couple of years that I visited. And then in the morning after the dry, we peel them off and then uh, the paper is ready to be transformed into a book or uh, to be uh, written on to be used as a letter. Um, the steps that you won't see now because we just don't have enough time is um, the pressing of the paper, the hanging to dry. And, uh, uh, but I'll pull all these tonight and then I'll talk to um, the Tri Cities. Maybe I can mail them to you guys tomorrow. Okay, so Yanni can hand it over to me. There's Yana. <laughs> She's covered in wet slurry. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you, Yana. <laughs> mm. So that that's my that that concludes my studio tour. I'm uh, more than happy to take questions or comments. Let me just put in my headphones. Did I lose everybody? Did anybody make it all the way to the end? <laughs> One second. I see somebody's typing.
So yeah, that's this is the studio where um, essentially the main, you know, the most of the work that Peace Paper Project does is uh, is 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 transient. So we, you know, I fly around the world and bring together a team in different in different locations, and we basically run workshops like we did at Tri Cities, where we train individuals. Um, how to use or build or uh, these studios and make paper and engage with the community. Um, so this uh, studio here is the main uh, headquarters for Peace Paper Project in Europe. And so we, because we have this uh, visiting artist residence um, and the uh, studio right out the, across the wall here, um, we're able to bring people in and, uh, and, and they can execute specific projects or they can undergo trainings um, and do different things. And so this is our like our location. This is our site uh, where we have uh, boots on the ground year round. Um, about uh, when was it? it was in July, we had um, two women uh, who built their own Hollander beater from Budapest. And so they came and then they, uh, they uh, learned how to make paper. And so they spent about two and a half weeks um, making paper with us here. And so, uh, so we use it not only to create works of fine art and exhibitions, but also to uh, create um, as a training uh, location. Any questions? Thoughts? Did I lose you? It was wonderful to see your studio. I was able to attend a last year's workshop, Drew. And so okay. the, the virtual just is an additional treat this year to actually see the studio in Germany. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is home for me. So, so it's like you guys are coming into my house, <laughs> my studio house. Now, this is a very good question. I see this one about COVID. Okay. Should, should, I, should I answer it? From Megan Murray, right? Um, things definitely for Peace Paper Project have changed uh, significantly, as you can imagine. Um, the work that we do uh, or have been doing uh, uh, you know, since 2011 is really about engaging directly with people. So just the, the, the base idea that we need to be you know, a meter and a half or two meters away from somebody is very difficult uh, in, in, these, in the workshop uh, setting. Um, so uh, you know, when we had our first shutdown here in, in Hamburg in March, mid-March, uh, everything, was, everything was shut down. So all of our classes were canceled. Uh, and uh, just everything kind of came to uh, a complete halt. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, you know, I have a visa to live and work here in Hamburg and I'm a registered artist uh, with the, the state here. And so I received, I'm still receiving a livable wage here uh, to basically con continue to work and operate even though I'm not able to do the work that I, I've set out to do. Um, so I'm surviving, which is nice. Um, but Peace Paper Project, as a result of COVID and the limitations, and just really the the sheer uh, kind of danger of of of, uh, of conducting workshops the way that we used to, uh, we're on pause until 2023. Really, I can't I can't imagine before that. Let's see. There is some kind of some talk about a vaccine, uh, so hopefully 2021, 2022, uh, we can go back to work. But really the work that we do, you know, whether it's going into the slum or going into a, a very densely populated urban area and working with hundreds of people um, in COVID times, you know, it's not responsible. Like we can't do that. Um, we could wear masks and we could disinfect molds and decals and things, but that doesn't mean that the people that are coming to the workshops are doing the same thing. So it's uh, out of respect and responsibility to the people that we provide these services for, um, we're kind of on pause for that community building. Um, here in Hamburg, um, we are able to continue to do workshops. Just this past weekend, we had a workshop. Um, so we had eight participants based on the square meterage of our space. 
were allowed to have so many participants. So we had eight students uh, coming in and we did our global paper making workshop, um, which was only one day. Uh, everybody had to wear a mask. They all had to have their own molds and decals. They all had to have their own vats. They all had to have their own hand sanitizer. They all had to stay six, uh, two meters uh, apart from each other. It was very, very, uh, very structured. Um, and so uh, this is the third time that we've taught, uh, third or fourth time that I've taught workshops during the pandemic. And it's very much about having everything set up and, and, and laid out and uh, properly kind of coordinated, engineered so that people don't uh, infect each other really. Um, so in a classroom setting, we've been able to con continue, but in a public setting where we do our workshops like we did at Tri-Cities, no way. And I don't see it. I don't see it for a while. If maybe with uh, like uh, maybe the powers that be, whether it's Biden or Trump who become president, will actually take the COVID situation seriously and actually kind of like address this and get people out there. Maybe we can kind of dial it back a little bit, but uh, I just don't know. So it's really changed, it has. And the, uh, you know, I uh, have a invitation to help design a program in New Zealand. Um, and it came in right before COVID. And we, uh, you know, uh, we're applying for like $50,000 to set up a paper making program with indigenous people living in New Zealand as a way to kind of help them kind of uh, tell their story and represent their voice. And we're all basically just shaking our heads going, okay, so we wait until this is over to continue this, uh, this, this, this process. Um, but we have done some workshops like uh, uh, there in uh, one of the, every year for the last 10 years, we've done workshops uh, in, at a prison for children outside of New York City. And I thought that that was gonna be dead in the water um, because of COVID. But the, uh, the prison said, no, no, everybody here is tested, we're fine. So as long as the facilitators are tested and we can maintain this distance and we can create a structure of a uh, workshop structure that uh, uh, basically where the kids are safe, then they, we could do it. So um, I was not stateside to do that. But I basically, one of the Peace Paper Project facilitators from New York was able to go in and spend the week working with the incarcerated children. Um, so that project has been able to run um, so it's not all over, it's not all bad news, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's challenging to, to be an artist who's working in the social sphere or using, uh, you know, paper making as a form of socially engaged art practice. I think COVID is like your worst nightmare. <laughs> you know, I guess Ebola would be worse, but the, um, basically to have a pandemic happening is kind of like, you know, I'm spending a lot of time in the studio working on my own work now, which is okay you know I'm not I'm not really complaining I'm alive and I'm well and I'm you know there are a lot of you know the situation could be a lot worse so um, my objective is to survive and see my friends and family and community members survive um, and my community around me survive so that we can all see better days uh, ahead but I think that's a very good question that you asked As you know, I mean, Washington State University is, are you guys going all online next semester? I think very smart, very wise, I think. I think it's very uh, unwise to go, like a, I've given a number of lectures this past fall um, instead of coming stateside and schools like Edgewood College or St. Lawrence University or a number of these schools, they all started okay. But then, you know, about four or five weeks in, they, they started to have problems and now they're like isolating students and they're really scrambling to figure out how to keep their student body safe. And I think it's surprising that they open their doors at all. I think it's much smarter to do online right now. So. <laughs> yeah. We will go ahead and close for today. Okay. Um, but I'd like to invite everybody back next week, um, Thursday the 19th at 1210. Um, Drew's going to give us a hands-on book binding workshop. So that'll be very, very awesome to join in. We hope uh, everyone has a well day. Yeah. Take care Thank and you very Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really look forward to seeing you next week, okay?
Let's make some books. Be well. (laughs) Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.